you want to open up in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4 will be beginning at verse 2. Colossians 4 verse 2. I'm sure you've noticed in, uh, in your years of, of reading the Bible that it's, it's really hard to miss that prayer is something that's extremely important. In fact, the words pray, prayer, and praying and other you know, prayer-related words are used 375 times throughout the Bible. And that's not even counting the many, many times that there are legitimate prayers that are happening where the word pray isn't happening or isn't used. For instance, uh, the book of Psalms. There's 150 psalms, and basically every single one of those psalms is a prayer. And so that's not even counted in this 375 times that that word is used. And so clearly we know that prayer is important. And that's why our mission statement here at Church of the Open Bible starts by saying that it's our desire to be a people of prayer. That's what we want to be about here at Church of the Open Bible, a people of prayer. And I'm very, very thankful for the different ways that I've seen that play out uh, in our church. You know, there, there have been times that I've been told by, by many of you that you are praying for me, and I appreciate that uh, an awful lot. Uh, some of you have even come by my office and prayed with me right there, and that's another thing I appreciate a ton. I know that when life groups get together, they're studying the word, but also taking time to pray with and for one another as well. At our missions conference the last two years, after a, a missionary has come up and shared, uh, some of you have stood up and prayed for that missionary publicly. And these are just some, some very public examples of how I've seen that we are a church devoted to prayer. And I know that there's also other things that are happening behind closed doors that none of us necessarily always see as well. Uh, many of you, of course, are, are praying at home. Uh, and even here at the church, when there's meetings going on, whether that's council meeting, elders meeting, deacons meeting, committee meetings, youth leader meetings, uh, staff meetings, there's prayer. Prayer is a huge part of those meetings. And, and so if I consider all of that, I have to say I'm, I'm encouraged by what I see. I'm encouraged uh, that our, our statement that says we are a people devoted to prayer, that we, uh, to our, our, our desire is to be a people of prayer, that I can, I can see that. I see that play out. But this morning, I do want to just gently remind us that we shouldn't settle. It's great that we are a people of prayer, but we never want to get to the point where it's like, all right, and now we've done enough. We're all good. Because uh, I'm sure that, that you've experienced times in your life where prayer isn't easy. Maybe you don't feel like you're a person of prayer. And I know that I, I have felt that way many, many times in my life. And maybe you, like me, have found it's far too easy to be casual in your prayer life or to be distracted as you pray, maybe even flat out selfish with the times that you are praying. I know, again, I found all of these things to be true. But thankfully, the Bible gives us the remedy to each of these things, to that, that selfishness, that casualness that we might find. And I think we see that here in this verse in Colossians chapter 4, chapter 4, verse 2, where we see three commands regarding practicing prayer. So let's look at Colossians 4, verse 2 here together. It says this, Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. That's just a, a short, short verse, but a helpful and practical one. I'll read it one more time. It says, Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. So the, the first command that we see here in this verse tells us to be steadfast in prayer. Now, we might ask the question, what, what's the meaning of being steadfast in prayer? Well, another way to think of this is to be faithful or to be diligent in prayer. And I particularly like the way that the NIV translation uh, puts this verse when it says that we are to devote ourselves to prayer, being devoted. This means that prayer is something that we are to persist in and to commit to doing. It should be a consistent practice for those of us who are uh, believers. It should be a consistent element of the Christian life. And the scriptures tell us this time and time and time again. 
tons of places in the New Testament and the Old Testament tell us to pray always. Ephesians 6.18 says, pray at all times with all kinds of prayers and requests. 1 Thessalonians 5.17, pray without ceasing. Romans 12.12, be constant in prayer. Those are just a few passages, and so clearly we're called to be steadfast and devoted to prayer. And that's probably not news to any one of us. We know that that's what we're supposed to do. We know that we should be devoted to pray. But yet it's so, so easy to become casual and not committed to our prayers. And that's why I think maybe it's helpful to understand the motivation, the motivation for being steadfast in prayer. In other words, why is being devoted to prayer something that's so important? Well, I think one reason that steadfast prayer uh, is so important is that it brings us into greater fellowship with God. And it says this in Psalm 145, verse 18. It says, The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. And so that's telling us that when we call on the Lord, when we seek him in prayer, he draws nearer to us. And we need that fellowship. We need that fellowship with God that comes from prayer. It's vital to our spiritual health. In fact, I would say that us being devoted to prayer and and that fellowship with God that comes from that is just as important to our spiritual life as other people and community is to our physical life. And there have been there have been studies to show that one of the basic necessities of life is community, is other people. And if someone goes without other people for too long, bit by bit by bit by bit, they start to lose it. They, they can't handle it. You need other people. And I believe that the very same thing is true of our spiritual lives if we're not going to God, if we don't have that fellowship with God that comes from steadfast prayer. Our spiritual lives can bit by bit by bit by bit fall apart, can unravel. And so we need to be seeking God in steadfast prayer. Because the the reality is, we need that fellowship with God. Like we sang earlier, Lord, I need you. That is true. We do. We need him. That's, That's really what prayer is all about. It's why being devoted to prayer is so important. We need God. Prayer shows our attitude of dependence on God through the thick and through the thin. It says that we need help. And it says that we're not depending on our own devices. It says to God, Lord, I need you. And so we call out to God. As it says in Isaiah 41, verse 13, God says, fear not, I am the one who helps you. And so we go to him. We go to the one who helps us. And that's why Colossians 4, verse 2 here tells us to continue steadfastly in prayer because we need him. We need that fellowship with him and that should be our motivation to pray. I think it would also be helpful here to consider for a second some methods for being steadfast in prayer. And I think looking at biblical examples would be a helpful way to do this. So in Acts verse 2, I think we see a very, very good example of what it looks like to be steadfast in prayer. In Acts, verse two, or Acts chapter 2, we read about the day of Pentecost where the Spirit comes upon the disciples and they start speaking and people are hearing them in, in their own native tongues. And, and after that, Peach, uh, Peter, he preaches a sermon and 3,000 people come to faith in Christ, just like that. And the church is formed. The very first church is formed. And what's particularly interesting about that passage is right after the church is formed, this is what they do according to Acts 2, verse 42. It says that the church devoted themselves to the apostles' preaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. See, one of the first things the church did when they, when they formed, when they got together, was devote themselves to the prayers. And not just individually, when they got together, as a corporate body, they devoted themselves to praying. I think we tend to think of spiritual disciplines as something that's generally individual, generally personal, um, but that's simply not always the case. Sometimes our spiritual disciplines are supposed to be done together. And that's what we see here, the beginning of the church. They devoted themselves to the prayers as a corporate body. And so we too should devote ourselves to prayer when we gather together. 
Whether that's uh, on Sunday mornings like this during a time of pastoral prayer or when we have prayer and sharing times, of course, we want to devote ourselves altogether to prayer. Or if it's other times when the church gathers. Uh, again, at, at meetings or uh, if you're just going to, to someone's house or, or a life group, again, we want to make sure that we use those opportunities to devote ourselves to prayer. Make the most of every opportunity. And so I think when, when we get together, it's a good time to pray. And that's one helpful method to maybe help us see and help us practice being devoted and steadfast in prayer. Another method for being steadfast in prayer can be seen in the Old Testament, in Daniel chapter 6. And uh, we, we all know the account of Daniel 6, I think, pretty well. It's where a new decree had just been signed by the king that said no one could, could pray. No one could make a petition to any god, but they had to go to the king instead. And in Daniel 6, verse 10, we read about what Daniel did after hearing about this decree. It says this. Daniel 6, verse 10 says, He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. And that last part is the key here. Daniel prayed three times a day, not just after things started getting rough and hard and it was, uh, and you know, it was illegal to pray. Uh, no, he had done that previously as well. He was already in the pattern of praying three times a day. Even before this decree was signed, Daniel had scheduled time that he devoted to prayer. And that helped him remain devoted when life got even more difficult. And I think this is just a, an excellent example for us to do as well. It would be helpful to, like Daniel, commit specific times of our day to prayer. Now, I don't think it necessarily has to be three times that we have to, you know, make sure this is our blocked off time. But maybe, maybe it's one time. Maybe it's in the mornings. Maybe it's in the evenings. Maybe it's the middle of the afternoon. doesn't matter. But I think it would be a helpful way for us to devote ourselves to prayer. Maybe it is three times a day. I'm not sure. Depending on how much time you have, maybe. Um, but, but having these specific times of prayer help us to make sure that prayer is not something that's slipping through the cracks. Because if we don't have a time that we just devote ourselves to prayer, you can go a day very easily, get to the end of it, and realize, I didn't pray today. Or maybe all of a sudden that day turns into a week and it's like, have I prayed this week? But if we have those specific times, prayer won't slip through the cracks anymore because we are devoted to pray during that scheduled time. And we remain steadfast in prayer, which again is so, so important, which is what Colossians 4 verse 2 is telling us here. Well, if we move on to the second section now of Colossians 4, verse 2, we see that the second command given is to be watchful in prayer. As it says, being watchful in it. And the meaning of being watchful in prayer is basically to be alert or to be awake in our prayers. And this alertness or, or wakefulness seems to imply that we should be both spiritually alert and physically awake. And I think if we're being honest, we can all say that we're not always alert and awake when we pray. Uh, I'm very, very confident of that. You know, how many times during corporate prayer when we're gathered together on a Sunday morning it is, maybe it's during the pastoral prayer, maybe a different time, and you realize halfway through, I have no idea what's been prayed the last couple minutes. I think we've probably all been there. You know, we've paid little to no attention to what's being said. Or in your personal time, you start praying for one thing or for one person, and next thing you know, your mind's way off in left field. You know? Oh, I'm pointing right. Left field. Um, but we, we've all been there, right? You start praying for, I don't know, maybe it's like a while ago, I was praying for, for my grandpa. He's had some, some health concerns recently. So I was praying for him, and next thing you know, I was thinking about fishing. Uh, it's like, how did I get there? Well, I had a whole, I realized, it's like I was praying for my grandpa. I was hoping he could go on the fishing trip. Then I was thinking about the fishing trip. Next thing you know, that's all that was on my mind. I went from praying to thinking about fishing. And it happens all the time, right? We've all been there where our mind has drifted. Or another example, you tell yourself you're going to pray. And so you sit down or you lay down, you make sure you're nice and comfortable. And next thing you know, you're counting sheep. Again, I think we're probably all guilty of doing all of these things. But the word here is telling us that shouldn't be the case. We should be alert and uh, awake, both spiritually and physically. 
And Ephesians 6 verse 18 echoes the same thing that we see here in Colossians 4 verse 2, where it says, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Be alert. We shouldn't be found praying with our minds on hold and our mouth on automatic because prayer isn't some sort of nonchalant thing. We need to be engaged. We need to be active. We, we have to have this alertness of heart and mind when we pray because prayer takes legitimate spiritual effort. Prayer isn't something that's always easy. It simply isn't. We need to actually put in effort to make sure that we have this wakefulness, we have this alertness as we are praying. And so that's part of what we're being told here when it says to be watchful. But it's not just that spiritual alertness. We're also uh, told, I think, to be physically awake and alert. And there's many examples of this in the Word. One of the clearest, I think, is in Mark chapter 14. And that's when, when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's there with Peter and James and John, and he tells them to, to keep watch and to pray because, well, Jesus is about to be crucified and his trials are about to be happen, are happening, and so uh, Jesus says, stay and, and pray with me. But we know what happened as the disciples, they, they fell asleep, and so Jesus finds them sleeping. He wakes them up and he says to them, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. That's Mark 14, verse 38. And so Jesus started that whole thing off by saying, watch and pray. And that word watch is the same Greek word used in Colossians 4. That, that was, you know, to be watchful in our prayers. But in this case, Jesus is literally telling the disciples to be physically awake enough to pray. Because this is a hugely important moment of time. And Jesus recognized that prayer in that moment was far more important than the disciples catching up and taking a nap. He knew this was a time to pray. And I wonder how often that might be the case for us as well, where maybe we think what we need is a little nap, or we think what we need is a few extra hours of sleep, when in reality, maybe the best thing to do would be to stop and to pray. Uh, you know, I think a, a really good example of this for me is sleeping in. It's like I could either sleep in that extra half an hour, or I could wake up half an hour earlier than I might normally and spend that time in prayer. What, what is really going to be a greater benefit to me during that day? Probably that extra half hour of prayer to start off my day rather than a nap. And so maybe, maybe that's just something to consider. What, what is actually more important? What's more significant for my life uh, in that moment? Is it sleep or is it prayer? Because we're called to be physically awake and pray. But this, this passage in Mark 14 where Jesus is talking to his disciples, it also shows us a great motivation for being watchful in prayer. Because Jesus says here to be watchful and pray so that they might not enter into temptation. And then he tells them that, that the, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. See, they're, they're willing to pray in their spirit, but their flesh is so weak they just fall asleep. They succumb to that temptation just like that. See, watchful prayer is an important aspect of our spiritual health because when we are actively seeking God, we'll be far less likely to succumb to that temptation that Jesus is talking about here. We'll be, excuse me, we'll be far less likely to be seduced by sin and the things of the world. Watchful prayer gives us a spiritual strength to continue, even, even if we're standing face to face, we're facing temptation head on, if we're seeking God in prayer, we should be able to face that temptation and come out no worse for wear. Because being watchful in, in our prayers keeps us from that temptation, keeps us from falling to that temptation. There's one commentator that says that we have two options when it comes to temptation in prayer. He says, prayer will make a man cease from sin, or sin will entice a man to cease from prayer. I think that's, that's really true. Prayer will make a man cease from sin or sin will entice a man to cease from prayer. Well, we want to be uh, a people, we want to be a church who is being watchful in prayer so that we're not being seduced and succumbed to the temptation that we might be facing. And so that, that is one of our motivations for being watchful in our prayer. <clears throat> 
Another motivation for watchful prayer comes from our main passage in Colossians chapter 2, or sorry, Colossians chapter 4, and I'll just quickly read verse 2 again, but also verses 3 and 4, because I think this, this kind of gets at one of our main motivators for being watchful in prayer. So it says, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. I think what that passage is telling us there is that the motivation for being watchful and alert in our prayers is the great need of sharing the gospel, the great need of gospel proclamation. Because right after Paul says, be watchful in prayer, he asks that the people in, in the, the Colossian church pray for him, that he might make the mystery of the gospel clear, and that there would be doors that would be open for him to actually share that good news. See, the, the fact that there were so many people who hadn't heard or hadn't accepted the good news of Jesus Christ motivated Paul, and he was using it to hopefully also motivate the Colossian church and motivate us as well to be awake and alert in our prayers specifically for the lost, in our prayers for those who don't know the Lord. Uh, it's to motivate us to be watchful in our prayers, uh, to, to make sure that we're actually praying for opportunities and for courage to share the good news as well. So whether it be times when maybe you're, I don't know, randomly thinking of, of people in different countries, specifically, you know, countries in the 1040 window where basically the majority of people are unreached with the gospel. If you think of them or if you're thinking of unsaved neighbors or, or friends and family all of that should be an inspiration for us to actually be alert, to be watchful, to be awake in our prayers. Because a motivation for watchful prayer is the need for gospel proclamation. We need to be alert in our prayers because there's so many people who are lost and need to hear the truth. And so what do we do? We pray for them and we be alert in those prayers. Well, next we must figure out the, the method for being watchful in prayer. Uh, as, as we've already established, I think it's, it's pretty fair to say that it's easy to be listless and lethargic at times in our prayers, you know, to kind of be, be lazy about our prayers. And so what can we practically do to remedy that and to actually be watchful? Well, I have just a few suggestions. You can, you can take them or leave them, but I've found, uh, found these things to be uh, helpful at times for me to be more alert in my prayers. Uh, in, in your personal prayer, I would encourage you, if you have, have trouble being alert in your prayers, to write down your prayers as you are praying. Uh, keep, keep a prayer journal or, or, or something of the like to, to just keep you more focused as you're praying. Because if you're writing them down, you know, if you're drifting way off, well, all of a sudden you'll look down and realize you're writing about fishing when you meant to be writing about your grandpa, right? Uh, and so you can, you can write your prayers. Uh, that's a helpful way to be alert. And in a similar way, you can also just pray out loud. If, you don't, if you're not a writer, if you don't want to write your prayers, pray out loud. Often when we're praying on our own, we pray in our heads, right? Uh, I've found that if you, even if it's just quietly, even if you're just kind of, you know, mumbling to yourself or, or mumbling to God, I guess, but uh, even if it's not really within earshot of anyone else, just that action of actually talking can help us to be more alert as we pray. And it helps our mind from wandering too far. Another thing we can do is uh, pray scripture. As you read, you can make an effort to pray specific verses or, or specific passages. Instead of just reading it, kind of applying it to your prayer and, and praying it even as you, you read can be a helpful thing. Another thing we can do to be more alert in our prayers is, is to put distractions away. Whether that's your phone or, or something else that might distract you while you're praying, put it aside. You don't need to have it with you when you're spending time being devoted to prayer. Uh, it'll help you be a lot more alert in your prayers. So those are all things we can do in our, our personal prayer lives, but I also just have some advice about maybe being more alert in our corporate gathering as well. Um, if you're not the one that's actively praying in, in a corporate gathering, I would just encourage you to be an active listener. Uh, and I think this is pretty, pretty self-explanatory, but uh, 
if, if someone else is praying and you're listening to that prayer, you should actually be praying along with them. It's not just listening to the words that they're saying. We should be active members of the prayer even as they are praying. Uh, it's not like they're praying for something and then it's my turn and I pray for something else. We're all praying together. That's the idea of this corporate nature of prayer. We pray together. And so to be an, an active listener uh, would help an awful lot just to make sure that we are praying along with those who might actually be praying out loud in that moment. It'll help us be more alert, help us from you know, having no idea what's going on at the end of a corporate prayer. And so these are just a few suggestions that, that maybe you'll find helpful in being awake and alert in your prayer. Well, finally, if we go back to Colossians 4, verse 2, we see the third command here regarding prayer, which is to be thankful in prayer. And uh, the meaning of that is pretty self-explanatory, of course. It's to be grateful and to pray with gratitude. And, and I think with this command in mind, it, it's fair to say that prayer and thanksgiving should never be too far apart uh, in our Christian walks. When we pray, we should ideally have at least some thankfulness on our lips. And, and that seems pretty clear considering the countless places throughout the Bible it tells us to be thankful. And there's many, many, even just in the book of Colossians itself. But one of them that is the most clear, I think, is in Colossians 3, just a few uh, you know, verses up from where we were. Beginning at verse 15 to 17, the word thanks, thankfulness or thanks is used three times. It says here, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Those verses are a call for us to be overflowing with thankfulness in everything, to always bring our prayer of thanks before God our Father through the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, but but that's, that's something that's, you know, sometimes easier said than done. Sometimes it's a lot easier to uh, not be thankful and just to bring our laundry list of requests before God. Uh, and, and that's a good thing. We should bring our request before God. We've read many verses that have already said that. But we need to be careful not to just bring requests. Otherwise, our prayers suddenly become, you know, gimme, 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 or, you know, help, 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 help. And it has nothing to do with God. Our prayers end up becoming more me-focused than, than God-focused. And, uh, and we need to be very careful about that, I think. Uh, and, and a great example of someone who tended to more often than not be thankful in prayer is Paul himself. Uh, the writer of this letter in Colossians. Obviously, Paul went through an awful lot in his life. And even as he's writing this letter, and most of the letters in the New Testament, he's in prison. And yet, throughout all of his letters, he continually says, I'm thankful for this. I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful to God for this. So on and so forth. And he encourages others to also be thankful. Because he recognizes that thanksgiving is a hugely important part of our prayer, and it should flow from our hearts as believers. And, and our motivation to pray with that type of thanksgiving, I think, is pretty simple. There's a lot of things that God has given us, right? Tons and tons and tons of blessings. Small blessings, big blessings, so that in, in the good and in the bad, there's always something, at least one thing, for us to be thankful for. Because if nothing else, we can always just be thankful for the gospel. In fact, I think Colossians 3.15 here, which I read before, maybe points us in that direction a little bit. Because it ends by saying, indeed, you were called in one body. Right? You were called into be, being the church. Basically, it's recalling salvation. It's saying you were called into this body. You were called into the church. You have been saved. And then it says, and be thankful. When we've been given such a good gift, like, the, like salvation, like being called into uh, such a, a, an amazing universal church, a, a corporate body like we are, we should be naturally thankful because that's the greatest gift we could ever be given. Uh, and normally when we're given great gifts, uh, 
the result is to be thankful for it. Uh, I know for, for me growing up, I, I'm still made fun of this to this day uh, for this. And uh, I would be given a gift at, at like Christmas or my birthday. And my response was always like this really squeaky, high pitched, thanks. And I said that every single time I got a gift, thanks, thanks. And, uh, but I do remember one specific time I got this, this fishing rod, back to fishing again, of course. Um, that was like my very first fishing rod. I was three years old. I got this gift from my grandparents for Christmas and I opened it up and not only did I say thanks, but I also said, this is the best gift ever because I was truly thankful and I ran up to grandma and grandpa and gave them a big, old, huge hug. Why? Because I was thankful for the amazing gift that they had given me that, you know, maybe started an unhealthy passion for fishing in my heart. But how much more should we naturally give endless thanks for the greatest gift that was actually ever given, which is salvation? The gift of salvation and the many other gifts that God has given us is a huge motivation for us to pray with thanksgiving at all times. Another motivation for thankful prayer is also quite simple. It's what God desires for us. He wants us to be thankful in prayer. It's pretty clear here in chapter 4, verse 2, but 1 Thessalonians 5.18 makes it especially clear. It says there, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do you want to please God? Give thanks. And that should really be our, our motivation for, for giving thanks. As it pleases him. It's what he wants from us. It's his will for us in Christ Jesus. And so that is our motivation for giving thanks to God, to please him. And, and there are also just a, a couple methods that I, I might share with you for how to, uh, how to be thankful in our prayers or to remember to be thankful in our prayers. The first one is something that, uh, that Pastor Jay has mentioned from the pulpit before, and that's just to take some time, consider the many blessings that God has given you, and write them down. And see how quickly you can fill up, you know, like a page of loose leaf or, you know, a document on your computer or whatever. Because it won't, it shouldn't take much time at all, because God, again, has given us so many blessings. And, and once you see all these amazing blessings that are on that page, remember to give thanks for them to go to God, the one who's given you these great gifts, and to say, God, thank you. And a second method for, for being thankful is to sit down to pray for 10 minutes and try your hardest not to bring any request. Not a single request to God in 10 minutes of prayer, but just thank him. I, I think it's probably impossible. I think naturally, even at the end, if nothing else, we'd probably bring up a little request because we're so prone to doing that, right? But I think it would be a, a helpful exercise for us to even just take 10 minutes to pray and to just give thanks and, and give glory to God during that time. And it might be pretty eye-opening how difficult that can be to do because, again, we're so prone to just asking for things, which is good but we need to make sure it's balanced out with thanksgiving as well. Because that's what the word is telling us to do. It's telling us to pray with thanksgiving. In the, in the 19th century, there was an evangelist by the name of George Mueller, and he's probably known as one of the, the men who is the greatest prayer warrior of all time, or one of them at least. And, and he's largely considered to be such a, a great man of prayer because of the amount of answered prayers that, uh, that he saw while he was running an orphanage in Bristol, England. But it's not just the answered prayers that show us uh, that he's such a great prayer warrior. It's also his obedience to what we read here in Colossians 4, verse 2. See, George Mueller was a man who was steadfast in prayer. In, in the orphanages that Mueller ran, he made sure to pray every single morning with the children. He had a committed time where he prayed with the children in his orphanages to one, for one thing, just to show them the importance uh, of prayer and being devoted to it, but also because he wanted to make sure that he devoted that time with a, a, a gathering of people to actually pray. And he also took much of his own personal time to pray as well. In fact, in his autobiography, he said, uh, he said this. He said, I live in the spirit of prayer. I pray as I walk about when I lie down and when I rise up. And the answers are always coming. 
See, George Mueller is a man who took seriously the call to be steadfast in prayer. He said that he lived in the spirit of prayer. That's being devoted. That's being steadfast to prayer. But he was also a man who was watchful in his prayer. And it was the need of salvation for lost sinners that motivated him to have that alertness and that watchfulness in his prayers. Uh, Over the course of half a century, George Mueller prayed for the salvation of five men, five of his friends. And even when sickness came upon George Mueller or fatigue, tiredness, whatever, he remained spiritually and physically alert enough to always, every single day, pray for those five men because they were lost. And so that motivated him to be alert in his prayers for them. And one by one, they came to faith. And largely, I would say that's in part because uh, of Mueller's watchful and alert prayers for them for over 50 years. But Mueller was also known for praising and thanking God for the many uh, prayers that he saw answered. He once wrote, I've recorded my petitions that when God has answered them, his name will be glorified. So Mueller had a book that he kept every single request in that he ever made before God, and he would go back to see, okay, oh, God's answered this one and this one and this one and this one and this one, and then he would glorify and he would thank God for every single request that was answered by God. He would make sure he always, always went to God with thankfulness. See, men like George Mueller and and men like Paul, they understood what it's like to practice prayer. They knew that they needed to be steadfast in prayer, to be watchful in prayer, and to be thankful in prayer. And, And again, I know that we know that all of these things need to happen in our lives. This isn't anything new for any one of us, but my hope is that this morning this this encouraged us to continue to grow in these areas uh, during our, our times of prayer. And so to close, I just want to remind us again of a few of the different methods that I mentioned earlier that that maybe you can apply even if it's just this week. And I would strongly encourage you to take one of these methods and apply it to your prayer life this week and see if it makes any difference. See if you can notice, oh man, yeah, that did really reinvigorate my prayer life or this did really help. And so maybe, maybe something you feel the need to work on is to be steadfast, that steadfastness of prayer. Well, again, and you can commit to a specific time every day that you'll devote to prayer. Just doesn't have to be a large chunk of time, just a small chunk of time that you can say, yep, yeah, I'm going to commit this time to prayer. And maybe you even want to do that in a specific place. Uh, sometimes people find that helpful to not just have a time, but just a little place where they know that they'll be in private and can specifically devote that time to prayer. That's one thing you can do if you want to grow in your uh, devotedness to prayer. If you're thinking about, well, maybe I need to grow in my watchfulness and my alertness, you can write down your prayers or pray out loud to keep you attentive. You could also seek to pray the scripture that you're reading during your devotions, if that's something that you think would be helpful. And, uh, and that hopefully will help you be spiritually awake in your prayers. Or maybe uh, the thing you want to grow in is your thankfulness in your prayers. And if that's the case, you again could take the time to write down some blessings from God and just thank him for those blessings. Or you could just take 10 minutes every day and try to not bring any requests, but only to thank God during that time. And, uh, and just see if that will help improve your thankfulness in your prayer. My hope is that if, if each one of us puts at least one of these methods into practice this week, it will help us overall as individuals and as a church to grow in our practice of prayers. And who knows, maybe it will even help us build new habits that we can continue on for the rest of our lives as well. And, uh, and my hope above everything else this morning is that we would remember the importance of being steadfast, watchful, and thankful in our prayers. So let's take some time now and go to God in prayer together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and that it tells us so much about prayer and the importance of it and specifically, Lord, as we saw this morning, the importance of being steadfast in prayer, of being watchful in prayer, and being thankful.
And we pray, Lord, that you would, you would help us this week to, uh, to put these things into practice. Uh, Lord, that you would remind us even as we go from here to put maybe even just one of these methods into practice in our lives, that we might grow in our prayer as a church. And again, Lord, I just want to thank you so much for, for that devotedness to prayer that I have seen in our church. And I just pray that that would continue to grow and grow and grow over time, uh, that we would continue to just uh, grow closer to you as we want that fellowship from you that comes from steadfast prayer. And so, Lord, we just lift these things up to you today. And we thank you, Lord. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.